All right, Orika, welcome to Save the Children's Open University Online Training. And we're going to be talking about child rights governance today with Orika Solis. Hi, Orika. Hi, Johnny. Hi, everyone. Great. So, Orika is a very old colleague of mine, and I'm so excited to have her on the webinar today. Orika works as the Global Advocacy Manager for Save the Children's Global Initiative on Child Rights Governance. Before this, she held a number of different roles within the organization, including the Africa Coordinator for Child Rights Government, Governance, uh, GI, Global Initiative, and the Regional Program Manager for Save the Children Sweden in Southern Africa. Before joining Save the Children, she worked for the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs for more than 10 years, focusing on peace and security and human rights. Ulrike has a Master's of Law from the University of Lund in Sweden, with a focus on international law and human rights. You will now be placed in the conference. To mute your line, press star 6. To unmute, press hash 6. Welcome, Ulrika, to this webinar. I'm really excited um, to have this conversation with you about child rights governance and the advocacy strategy of the CRG. Um, and just one more quest, request out to people. Can you see the PowerPoint on the LinkedIn program? Um, if not, don't worry, we'll send out a link with the program, but it just if you can see it, will you let me know? Ulrike, you're able to see it? Now it's the loading. Okay, unfortunate. All right, well, I'll carry on trying to load the CRG presentation, but in the meantime, I think, Ulrike, let's just kick it off. We've got quite a few people online, and I'd just like to encourage listeners to please feel free to put in your comments, thoughts, as well as questions that you may have for Ulrike in the IM section of the LinkedIn program. You're also more than welcome to switch on your microphone, most of you are on mute, and just ask us some questions. While Ulrike is speaking, I may mute you, so uh, again, you can just try and you can unmute yourself and um, speak to us. Great. Ulrike, child rights governance. Isn't it all advocacy is my question. What are we talking about with a specific CRG advocacy strategy? Sure. Well, it's not all advocacy, but it's a lot of advocacy. So, of course, the whole, our whole child rights governance strategy is, uh, is focusing on a, on a number of different things. Uh, and a number of things that are not advocacy, but as most of you know, a lot of it is about advocacy at different levels. So yes, in a way you are right, but not everything. Uh, child rights governance advocacy focuses, we are focusing on, I would say, five key areas in our CRG advocacy strategy, which runs uh, for the period 2013 to 15. Uh, it's about accountability and using the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Human Rights Council, UPR, and regional mechanisms to hold governments to account. And more importantly, to sending reports to these um, mechanisms is also to use what is coming out as recommendations in national advocacy. Uh, it's about investment in children, making sure that there is more and better spent money for children and to influence governments around that. Uh, it's about the post-2015 agenda and to make sure that uh, we have a governance goal included in the goals and targets of the post-2015 agenda that is going to be agreed in September. But not only a governance goal, but also hopefully a good accountability mechanism for the post-2015 goals that we then can use together with the other monitoring mechanisms to make sure that governments are delivering for children. It's also about making sure that governments establish the systems and structures that needs to be in place for all, for them to catch any child rights challenge they might have. So some of you might have heard about what we call as general measures of implementation which is a framework developed by the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And it sets out what governments need to put in place in order to realize all rights for all children in all circumstances. So you need to have comprehensive Children's Act in place, you need to have a national plan of action, you need to have a children's ombudsperson, all of those things. And finally, 
Yeah, just oh, give me... Go ahead, the final one, and then I'll... And then the I'll final ask. one. It's also to make sure we have an enabling environment for civil society, including children in civil society, to uh, be actors and influence children's rights. As you know, in many countries, there is a bit of a shrinking space for civil society to act. So if we're going to do good advocacy for for children's rights, we also need to be able to work with our partners in an environment where we can have a voice for children. So those are sort of the main five components of the CRG advocacy strategy for this period. Wow, well, Ulrika, that is no small mandate. And by the sounds of it, this cuts across a lot of different thematic areas that Save the Children's working in. Before I even get there, though, I would love to hear from my listeners if anybody's got any thoughts on the shrinking space for civil society. I think some of our listeners are, are um, joining us from country offices where they're starting to see that shrinking space, and it would be great if they could share with us what that actually looks like and what they're seeing on the ground. But back to my first point, Ulrika. How does this now cut across things like education policies, uh, health and nutrition policies? Is there overlap? How are we managing that overlap in terms of advocacy? I would um, be a bit controversial and say there is no overlap, but of course there is a little bit. In the sense that, of course, if you work on education or if you work on health or protection, you will also probably work on ensuring that there is a child protection policy or an education policy and that there is money for education and all of those things. You are ensuring sort of those kind of things on an advocacy level within those thematic areas. What child, what child health governance is trying to ensure is those broader systems and structures that might not be specific to a, a specific theme of child rights and to make sure that those ones are in place. So, for example, we would like to have children's ombudspersons in a country or a human rights a commission in a country that promote and monitor all children's rights. That would mean, of course, that they would focus on education, they would focus on health or protection, but that might not be an issue that education colleagues would push for specifically. So we're trying to put that institution up and running. We're also trying with an investment in children um, uh, work to, to work together with colleagues and the Everyone campaign on health financing, education financing, protection financing, financing for social uh, protection, high Richard. And, uh, but we do it to try to do it in a broader framework where we look at financing principles more broadly, ensuring that there is budget transparency, opportunities for participation, accountability, and that we work on advocacy for investment in children where the left hand knows what the right hand is doing so that we're not pushing for more money for education and the government says, well, great, we'll do that, but we'll, we'll take it from health. Yeah, so really interesting. Point that way. Yeah, and I've heard country officers and members talking about that, you know, how, how do they balance this out. So it sounds like the CRG approach is really about building the foundation, the structures that cut across every single thematic area. Tell us specifically on the CRG advocacy strategy, what are you guys looking for? What are the types of results you're, you're hoping to see with the advocacy strategy? Yes. Yeah. So... Of course, at a national level, if we start there, we of course want to have a government where we can see that we have government budgets that are allocating enough for children, that are spending it well, and where there is opportunities for civil society and children and participating in that. We want to see governments that have ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child and these three optional protocols and the new one on a communications procedure so that we can use that as the standard for our work. We want to see uh, opportunities for children to realize their civil rights and freedoms. So, for example, we want to see that children uh, have, have access to birth registration that children have an opportunity to get child-friendly information about what is happening within governance, that they can express their views freely together with other civil society actors, that they can form their own organization, and, and, and so on. Uh, we want to see children persons in place. 
We want him to see coordination mechanisms within government so that, you know, the left hand and the right hand of government knows what they are doing around children's rights and coordinate it and do it sort of in one spirit. Um, yeah, and we want to see in October a post-2015 agenda where governments have committed to good governance, where they are committed to more money for children through the financing of the goals and targets, and a good accountability mechanism that we can use to hold governments to account for what they promised uh, their citizens. I want to come back to the post-2015 governance discussion, Ulrika, but before I move on, can you give us some really concrete examples of where you've seen really strong CRG advocacy happening, like a country program or a member or just anywhere where, where, you, can, where you can say, now that is a good example of CRG-related advocacy? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. And listeners, if you've got sure. a good idea, please share that too. Can I give you a couple so that I'm not just um, singling out one individual country? Uh, oh, yeah, another PowerPoint presentation in Africa. And I actually just wanted to point you to the publication that is on that picture. Because I think that there is, um, we are very good at submitting supplementary reports and child-informed supplementary reports to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. We are good at using the Universal Periodic Review in the Human Rights Council, but we are not always that great in using the recommendations that are coming out at that international level in our national advocacy. However, there are many uh, nice exceptions to that rule. <laughs> uh, in, and we have just produced together with our office in Geneva uh, this, this uh, publication called Universal Periodic Review, Successful Examples of Advocacy. And for example, in there, there's a very good example from Bangladesh, but there are many good examples, but there is one from Bangladesh where they made sure that they got the Human Rights Council, UPR, to recommend issues around law reform. Then they used that recommendation in Bangladesh to incorporate it in their advocacy for a new and better Children's Act. And a while after the UPR and with a lot of advocacy around that, they actually adopted a comprehensive Children's Act in Bangladesh that was taking a lot of ch save the children and their partners' uh, points in consideration. So that's one example. Another very nice example, I think, around investment in children is that in Tanzania, save the children worked with, um, I think, close to 30,000 children. They, train, they talk to them about children's rights, they talk to them about investment in children, and based on that, these children engaged with, engaged with the, the district budget. So they sat down with government officials, talked through proposals, and they were quite successful. So, for example, in, in two districts, it resulted in 455,000 children benefiting from school feeding programs. And in other districts, they recruited 52 additional uh, teachers. And I think those are really, really fantastic examples of how you can work with children to actually influence um, more and better spend money for children based on what they think is important. Uh, should I give you more examples, Charlie? Well, hang on a second. I just want to explain to people. Ida has just loaded up the PowerPoint. So if you can see it, great. If you can't see it, drop your email address into the IM section, and I will forward the PowerPoint to you. We will also have this PowerPoint loaded onto the training website so that you can also re reference it as you listen to this um, this video. But, Ulrika, those sound like great examples. Just um, any other specific examples? I think really the investments in children is an incredibly powerful um, tool for Save the Children, and I think people are always asking, how does that actually fare itself out? So any other examples you have on that would be great. Well, we, we, of course, I have Bob on the call, uh, our investment in children manager. He has a lot of examples. But I think another example, which is an example from Nicaragua, but I think has played out in many countries in Latin America, 
And that is that Save the Children have worked with local governments and municipalities to, to sort of train them on children's rights, to form them into child-friendly sort of networks of municipalities, and then help them to engage with children. And children have influenced these municipalities again on investment in children. And actually, um, you see here on this uh, slide that there has been a 92% increase in the annual average municipal investment in children during this period, and actually in, has benefited hundreds of thousands of children. So I think that is a great example. Another one which is linking more the national to the local level on investment in children, as we can see that we are victory at, at the moment, is that when we started to look within the UN, both in, uh, at the, within the UNDA in New York, but also within the Human Rights Framework in Geneva, there was very little focus on investment in children. So there was some discussion around, yes, we talk about health of children, so we will mention something about the importance of resourcing health, but that's it. There was no just resolutions, no discussions and reports that turned that focus around and said that these are the child rights principles and good governance principles you need to take into account to make sure that you, you spend, you, you allocate and spend well for children, putting children as a priority in that. So, oh, no. together on that with, point, yeah. On that point, why is there so much resistance to child rights governance and child rights principles? Is it a lack of awareness? Is it actually a disagreement with the principles? What is some of the motivation no. behind some of these policy makers and decision makers not no. taking uh, decisions that would support children's rights? I don't think it's so much that. That plays in sometimes. There is, at, at national level and in, in many countries, there is, of course, lack of political will. Maybe because children don't vote, uh, or that children are a bit invisible. But just to link it back to the youth, the Human Rights Council level, I don't think it was so much a question of resistance. It was just that you never thought about it like that, because they think very much about investment in children, uh, uh, children's rights in the sense of thematic issues, and not so much turning it around. So I think when we presented it to them and said, don't you want to have a resolution on investment in children? Don't you want to have a full day discussion in the Human Rights Council on investment in children? Everyone's like, yeah, that's good. Let's do that. So it was, I think people agree it's an important issue. And I, I have seldom met a government that says it's not an important issue. But maybe it hasn't been a political priority, and then of course when you start unpacking it and you start talking about corruption and other issues, there are governments of course that don't completely agree with it. Okay, and that's something really important when planning advocacy strategies is understanding why actions aren't being taken, why, who are the targets of your engagement, who are the stakeholders, and what is the perspective that they have? Because I agree with you. I think it's often they just haven't thought of it. They've got so many other priorities. Um, and when you do present it to them, they're, they're often keen to respond if, if they're able to. So I think great point on that. Um, on the post-2015, can I bring us back to the discussion around governance? Sure. So post-2015, I'm hearing the governance part of the post-2015 discussions is not going very well. It's really controversial. A lot of states are not happy with it. What's going on there? Well, you would be surprised how we think that maybe we have managed to secure it. Surprise, surprise. So, yes, when we started the discussions a year ago, as you know, the MDGs, there is no focus um, there's not a governance goal in the MDGs. So this is a new area. And something that we have argued is very important because how are you going to fulfill the other goals if governments are not transparent, not accountable, not inclusive, and all of that. So a lot of governments were a little bit like, no, 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 that's too sensitive. It, it's going to move into our sovereign sphere of governance and all of that. But then there was a process to look at a process with what was called the Open Working Group last year, which was set up to start looking at what goals and targets could look like for the first 2015. 
And last year, that was considered to be one input into intergovernmental negotiations for the post-2015 goals and targets that would start now in January and then end in September by adopting this goals and, and targets. But what happened was, and what it looks like now, is that actually that, that those 17 goals and 169 targets that this open working group adopted will be the foundation for the post-2015 goals and targets. Because governments are not keen to reopen the discussion. And goal 16 is the goal of governance. So if we are, if that whole actually sort of manage to overcome those sensitivities, and we might actually have a goal on governance in the post-2015 agenda. So, sensitive as it is, we might have security. Wow, that would be amazing. I think it would be a really fantastic base from which to continue the CRG work on. So, I think that's that's excellent progress there. I want to just jump to a question that Cardi from Sierra Leone just typed into the IM section. She's asking, is there an audit check framework that can help country officers know what is lacking regarding CRG so as to identify issues to take up? Do you, do you guys have something like that, Erica? Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, we have developed a whole uh, set of... Um, sorry, are there people... Can you just mute your line, please? I'm going to try and mute lines. But we're getting a lot of feedback here. All right. Ulrika, I think I've... I've done with it. Go for it. So, again, um, the yes. question that Cardi was asking on order check framework yes. to help them identify CRG issues. Sure. Yes, so we have developed a series of analysis tools to analyze the CRG situation in a country. That, of course, doesn't only focus on advocacy, it focuses on CRG programming as a whole. But considering that, here, that we all agree that a big part of CRG work is advocacy, I think those tools are very helpful to do that analysis. So there is a CRG analysis tool that you can find on the CRG web, web page on OneNet, and if not, I can also forward it to you. And it, it includes two steps, a preliminary analysis that goes through the different components of CRG work and helps you analyze where a specific country is on those specific issues so that you can identify maybe what would be the most relevant entry point for CRG work and advocacy in your country. And then the step two is then for those issues that you have identified to maybe go and do a deeper analysis so that you can identify maybe specifically what the issue is in more detail, but also to look at who are the stakeholders, you know, who is on the table, who is under the table, who is away from the table, all of those things. So uh, please go and look at OneNet, and at the end of the presentation, you'll also have the links to all of, all of those uh, um, pages. Uh, but otherwise, I can also send it to you. Great. I think that would be very helpful. And Cardi, let us know if you aren't able to find that resource on OneNet, um, and, and we'll hook you up with Ori for that. So there are tools out there for people to utilize to try and identify what are the CRG issues they uh, could potentially focus on in their work going forward. And something to really think about is countries are starting to look at country strategic plans for 2016 moving forward. So that's really important element of that. We have another question, and this is coming from Jeff He has a question on why are the governments and the leadership not keen on making CRG a critical issue? Most states have no vision on child rights and a mission for it. If it was traveling, how could they move if there's no destination of where they want to be? So very similar to the question I asked earlier, Ulrika, um, and I think Jeff is basically trying to say, like, wh why is there no vision? Why do we think this vision doesn't exist? Um, any thoughts on that? As I said before, I think in, in many countries it do exist. But where we see that there is not good progress on children's rights, I think one of the major uh, stumbling blocks, as Jeffter is pointing out, is lack of, of political leadership. So very often there is very lim there is not often well there is not always a link between countries that, for example, on investment in children that have a lot of money and then they are top performance on children's rights. 
There are many countries with limited resources that are doing a lot to improve children's rights, but they are prioritizing children. And I think we play a role in pushing the governments, pushing the issues on the agenda, and showing that realizing children's rights, it's, it's their right, it's a legal obligation, of course, but besides that, and in addition, it's also an economic good, good and sound decision. You know, investing in, in today's children is an investment in tomorrow's workforce, for example. There are a lot of, of uh, research and literature out there that help us to make those connections. So I think it's also to point out that, you know, it is a good investment. It's not just a legal obligation, it's a good investment for governments to do. Excellent, and, and I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, Save the Children is not often seen as the people that come forward with economic arguments, but I think there's a lot of evidence to show the increasing girls' attendance in school having an impact on GDP in some countries, increasing learning, can really improve the workforce, increasing health care will lessen the burden on a country. So um, all great points and things that I say the children's staff should have at the tips of their fingers when they're speaking to government about these types of investments, as well as to donors. Ulrika, do we do any advocacy with donors around child rights? How does that work out? Yeah, uh, we encourage uh, country office to do it. We are uh, working with our uh, office in Brussels a bit on it. So that, for example, we are pushing uh, our office in Brussels have been working with the EU for the new uh, framework so that children are visible in their external relations and also in their development assistance so that it's just not sort of one of one million things but, but a, a priority group. Uh, there is also a good example of, for example, again, the example from Bangladesh, uh, when the UPR recommendations came out from the second review of Bangladesh, our country officers engaged um, also with the donors in Bangladesh and had a commitment from a few donors there to actually prioritize children in their strategy and to work with the government of Bangladesh on this. So, and for example, in the work we are now doing with the Human Rights Council, we are also pushing that perspective that it's not only about more overseas development assistance, it's about making children visible in, and prioritized in over, over, uh, ODA, but also to use ODA as a catalyst for making sure that governments have you know, the capacity to increase, for example, tax revenue so that they can, they in themselves, actually generate resources to invest in children. Great. ODA for everybody is Overseas Development Aid. For So if you think of USAID or DFID or CEDA, those, those are our country's ODAs. Ulrika, I want to come and bring us back to the shrinking space for civil society. A lot of CRG is focused on an enabling environment for civil society, um, as well as children's engagement in that civil society. What, what do we see as the ideal in an enabling environment, and why are we seeing a shrinking space? Um, well, if to start, what is the, a good situation? I think a good situation is where citizens, adults, or children in a country can come together freely, they can express themselves, they can form their own organizations, and there is trust and space between civil society and government to engage. And that government understands that there are different roles to be played by civil society and government in, and business in a society. And that just because you're raising your voice against government or disagreeing, it doesn't mean that you're against them. I think there are different reasons why there is a shrinking space at the moment. Um, uh, I think, you know, the, what happened with the Arab Spring was very positive. Uh, and, and there was a lot of youth engagement in the Arab Spring, but I think it also scared off a lot of governments. I think it also, in Africa, for example, there was a few country governments that sort of uh, put in place policies and legislation that limited uh, civil society space. And quite frankly, there was maybe not enough pushback from the international uh, 
international organizations and others and got other governments and they got away with it. So then other governments got a bit of inspiration around that. So, I mean, there's of course many reasons for why, but we do see a, a tendency towards that, definitely. And where have we got some examples of where we've been at, in successful at creating or uh, getting government to secure an enabling environment for civil society. Do we have any good examples of that that we can share? Well, uh, I think it's a little bit early days yet. And there is quite a lot of good work happening. But I would say to say that we have managed to um, have a, you know, Put, a, put away a, a piece of legislation or amend a piece of legislation. I am not completely aware of any good examples of that, so if the group uh, have anything to share, that would be great. What, what when you look at children's um, engagement in governance and space for children in civil society, we have quite a lot of examples of that. There is a still a long way to go, but for example, you'll see I've included a uh, a, a, an example from Kenya where Save the Children was instrumental in working with the Kenyan government to set up a, uh, a children's assembly with structures in all counties that now provides an opportunity for children to engage at local, regional and national level governance in Kenya. So I think there are good examples. Um, and there are processes underway where Save the Children participate, but of course also a very sensitive issue. Uh, because uh, these kind of shrinking space issues is political sen politically sensitive. Okay, and I got a whole bunch of comments that came in as you were talking. Um, Bob was telling us, shrinking space is also measured by the quality of interactions between different actors and how power relations manifest themselves. And he's saying Kenya yeah. is a good example yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, so, so I think no, that, that would be good. excellent. And that is, that is a good example of it. Um, I think somebody else is just typing a comment there. All right, no, we'll pair it. Oh, say the children is involved in fighting the NGO bull and our partners and Bob, I think, is still fighting. I think, you know, say the children is very involved in fighting limitations on NGOs in Kenya as well as in Egypt after the Arab Spring because th that also appeared then. Um, so, really, we do have some examples. I don't know about the extent of say the children's direct engagement in that, and I think it brings me to the next point, Ulrika, which is how often is it really save the children, or is it, you know, are we in the front or are we behind, in, in, like supporting this? Because I think in many yeah. countries that I know of where we've got great CRG work, a lot of that is about the investment in local partners and yeah. helping them Absolutely. improve their voice. Absolutely. So... One of the two core objectives of child rights governance is to make sure that there is a strong civil society movement for children's rights in each country. And depending on that country and depending on what role we play in that country, we take sort of this, you know, we take more or less space. Of course, we are members in some countries. And as a member in a country, we play quite a different role maybe as compared to a country office where we might take a slightly different role and maybe work more in partnership uh, with local organization and build and build their capacity more to take that space. In other situations where there's a tricky space situation, there might be that it's easier for say the children to engage uh, and, and to support partners in different ways. So I think it's very contextual. But I think bottom line in our uh, strategy is that we do child rights governance advocacy in partnership with uh, local uh, children's organizations. And that also uh, is the case for the work we are doing at international level. I mean, the work we are doing with the UN on investment in children at the moment would not have happened if we hadn't done it in collaboration, both with international organizations like PLAN and UNITA, but also very importantly with regional child rights coalitions and partners with us. So that when I go to the UN and I say this is the situation and they say, but what do you know about Africa? Or what do you know about Asia? I can say, well, you know, the, the network that is supporting this, we have partners in Africa and Asia that, that 
that you can talk to around this in more detail. So I think that partnership for CIG advocacy is crucial at all levels. Uh, that's a great example, and Jephthah also gave an example of national child rights networks. And I think I liked his one specific comment, which was that critical to this is identifying the different issues that need to be addressed to come together and accept that no one organization can be held accountable for, for um, delivering on any of these issues. The child rights issues are cross-cutting, um, and so that's really a, a perfect yeah. example of what the value of those really Yes, and I think we are really, really uh, trying to, to support, I mean, most of the colleagues on this call, I'm sure you are working very closely to try either with an existing child rights coalition or network in a country or you're trying to establish one because I, I think it, it really adds value. Absolutely. And um, Kadi also just made a comment about, you know, part of the civil society Space is, uh, I think, in, in Sierra Leone, Cardi, I assume that's where this is taking place, a constitutional review where civil society have been given space and representation yeah. in all the pillars created, which is great. But again, to Ulrika's point, like as a network, they can only strengthen their support. Bob is saying yeah. Save the Children should also leverage its diplomatic connections, resources, and international outlook to speak out on shrinking space using acceptable means rather than leaving most of the work to partners, <laughs> absolutely. I think we all would want to make sure that we are holding up our share of the, of, of the argument of why this space needs to be protected and secured. So I hope we are doing that. Bob, do you think we aren't doing that? <laughs> Ulrika, do you think we're doing it? I let Bob respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I... I think there's no yes or yes, no, and maybe that is the correct answer. I think what I've seen is that in a, in a number of countries, when we feel it's getting hot, we say partners should take the lead, wow. and uh, we take a very big seat. So for me, we may not necessarily need to fight uh, from the front line, but we could fight from the rear, which I think is also quite important. For example, when I refer to the diplomatic connections, the kind of work that we can do with the land ministers we are working with, education, health, social protection, making a case for enabling environment without necessarily, you know, holding the banners and the placards. But for me, doing a lot of this behind the scenes work is fundamental. Yeah, I completely agree. And we have, we have platforms that many of our local partners don't have uh, that we need to be utilizing. But also you have to agree that local partners in many instances have more legitimacy arguing that point yes. in their country than sometimes Save the Children does. Yes, and I think, I think Shani, that that is part of the analysis for your, for your CRG advocacy, not only for shrinking space, but for any issue, I guess. In some countries, it might help on a certain issue and a certain point in an advocacy strategy if, say, the children is more in the forefront. But in some countries, it would be detrimental. So I think it's, again, to know your uh, environment for advocacy. I mean, as most of you know, I'm based out of South Africa. And here, when you have good and strong local partners, government listens to a much larger extent to, to their voices than they would to international organizations. While in other countries, that might not be the, be the same. So again, I think it's about knowing your context. Great. And Ulrika, that kind of brings me closer to the end of our interview, and I just wanted to ask you two questions. One is, what are your top tips for people working on child rights governance advocacy? And two, where can they get more information? Right. Uh, top tips now. <laughs> Maybe we should have a round through to the participants. I'm sure you have bigger ideas than I have, but let me start. I think, again, maybe I'm picking up from, from where I left the other discussion. I think it is know your situation. If you have done your situation analysis, you know what the situation is, you have a much stronger basis for advocacy and legitimacy in your advocacy. Know your stakeholders, know your actors, who are the influentials. Maybe it's not the one that you obviously think it should be. Uh, so know who, who is influential on what. 
I would say also for some CRG work, not all, but for some and, and maybe uh, specifically for investment in children, but I would say for other CRG components as well, uh, explore relationship with uh, actors that you might not normally work with. So there might be good economic governance organizations in, that works more on economic governance in your country that say the children might not normally have engaged with. But for issues around governance, investment in children, it might be useful to explore. Uh, work with UNICEF. I must say that uh, we have worked a lot with UNICEF on international advocacy, and it has been a, a fantastic relationship. Uh, I know it can be uh, different in different situations, but uh, they are working more and more, on, for example, on investment in children, and can be a very good ally around it. Use concluding observations. Please don't spend all that time working with your coalition to make a supplementary uh, report to the Committee on the Rights of the Child or a submission to the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council and you work and you work and you work. You submit it and you go to Geneva or you support the partners to go to Geneva and you exhaust it so now you just shelf it and wait for the next four years to come. Use what is coming out there, integrate it and help I don't know how many uh, of you, you that are on the call that are working specifically on CRG or if there is broader co colleagues working on other things. But what I think is really, really what we need to explore is to say, how can we use these concluding observations within say, the children broadly? Concluding observations, as you know, is not CRG concluding observation. There might be, but there is also on education, there is on health and on protection. And what we are trying to do at an international level is to create that framework of supportive arguments that you can use at national level. So it's not just save the children and our partners saying that this is an issue, but actually the UNGA General Assembly is saying the same, the Human Rights Council is saying the same, the Committee on the Rights of the Child is saying the same, you know, and in Africa, the Africa Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child is saying the same, and you can use that to say it's not save the children, it's us and others, and that can help in, in sort of putting your advocacy forward. And then, maybe last but not least, document what you're doing. Document for learning, document for results. I think we we just run, we, we very often we, we do things, but I think CRG advocacy is even more important because we need to, to establish that chain of influence so that when uh, colleagues, donors, whoever comes and says, but were you part of that? Are you sure that you influenced that? Can you take, take credit for that? We can really show the case of how we worked to achieve a certain result. So yeah, maybe that, but I'm sure there is other good ideas out there. Well, if anybody's got any other top tips, please feel free to type them out. Bob's got a bunch there. Um, and just while I've got Bob typing up things here, if you'd like to listen to Bob's webinar on budget tracking, you can also find that on the OU Save the Children Advocacy and Campaign training site. We did a whole session with Bob. Very interesting, very pertinent. Ulrika, my second question. Where can people get more information? Okay, yeah, you can uh, go to the last slide. I think most of the stuff is there. So uh, you can... Um, yes, Just read it through for us because we have some people that yeah, are calling so, on the telephone. So... The CRGI has a newsletter, and you can sign up to receive that newsletter uh, through the OneNet. Uh, you can, of course, visit our uh, CRG pages on the OneNet. Then there is a resource center that is uh, managed by Save the Children Sweden and has a huge, huge library of resources, not only on CRG, but on child protection and other issues. Uh, you can find all our publications there, but you can also find much wider mm, research reports and publications on different topics. So please go and listen to that. It's really useful. One thing we haven't spoken too much about is that one of the key advocacy issues for this period is to make sure that states ratify the, the third optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is on a communications procedure which means that if there is a child rights violation in a country and you can't find any solution to it at a national level, 
you can send that complaint to the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child in Geneva. So that protocol entered into force last year, but there's still a lot of, of uh, countries that need to, to, to uh, ratify it. There is an international coalition of NGOs that are working on ratification of this optional protocol, and there is a website with a lot of resources. Save the Children is part of the steering committee of this coalition. So you can find a lot of resources if you want to boost your advocacy on OP3 on that website. And then uh, we also have a CRGI advocacy working group that I'm sharing, and it's open to everyone who's interested. So if there's anyone on this call, who would like to join, just send me an email and I'll put you on, on the list, address list. We, we have a monthly call where we coordinate different things, discuss specific topics. So next time, uh, in two weeks time, we will have a more in-depth discussion on general measures of implementation and how we can move forward on advocacy around that. So please, if you're interested, you can just let me know. Excellent. Thank you so much for that information, Ulrike. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. There's clearly a lot of work to be done. Um, last comments? Yeah, maybe just to pick up on Richard's comment, finally. Oh, okay. Sorry. About the synergy between CRG and child poverty. Maybe, Richard, do you want to say something to that? I could do, um, if that's okay with everybody. Can you introduce yourself, Richard? Hi, uh, Richard Morgan. I'm the director of the Child Poverty Global Initiative, which is a very close sibling to child rights governance. Um, I just wanted to say how much I agree with uh, everything that Ulrike has, uh, has said. And I, I think, first of all, um, in some sense, creating rights-respecting societies, such child rights-respecting societies, and uh, making sure that no children live in extreme poverty are, are extremely complementary, and both are absolutely necessary conditions for Save the Children's Breakthroughs and the Sustainable Development Goals for Children, such as no preventable child deaths and all children protected from violence, to be achieved. Uh, both poverty and the lack of respect for children's rights in societies really drags down our um, ability to achieve those ambitions <laughs> and I think <coughs> sorry they both need to be assured just one of the th synergies I wanted to point out is that while child rights governance works very much as, as has been described with governments to try to influence their uh, public spending allocations and the ways in which national programs are delivered, um, we in child poverty will hope to work um, particularly to empower households and families with children and perhaps to send children themselves to be able to demand their rights, to be able to overcome local barriers based to access to basic services and other ways of fulfilling their rights. So in that sense as well, if, if we were working with children directly and more at a, um, a family and household level, um, we, we will link up to the efforts that JRS governance is making more at the societal level. Great. Thanks for that, Richard. And absolutely right, the linkage is there. Excellent example. All right, I'm so sorry, everybody. We have to end this webinar. I realize we could have continued talking for quite a while. Uh, thank you so much for your participation, all of the listeners, and for your very active input. It's always appreciated and makes the conversation so much more, so much richer. Um, thank you, Ulrika, for the, taking the time um, to present the Child Rights Governance Advocacy Strategy. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, and everybody, please do look at the links that we've included in the IM section. Also, take a look at OneNet under the What We Do portion of OneNet. You'll find the CRG link, and you can go there to look at more information. Thanks again for your participation. Everybody have a lovely morning, afternoon, and evening. Bye-bye.